Okay, welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture hosted here at Gallaudet University. Welcome to those here in the auditorium and also welcome to those online that are remotely following this presentation. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is The Origin and Nature of Language, Numeracy, and Thought. With this lecture series, we honor world-renowned scientists who works, whose work increases our understanding of the human mind and the neural mechanisms of learning, thus contributing to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. Making our distinguished lectures accessible to everyone, we want to build bridges across scientific communities here in DC, but also across the nation. We hope many may enjoy these exceptional talks wherever they are through our service, uh, streaming service. Today, we have the honor and pleasure of welcoming Dr. Stanislas Dehan, professor and chair of experimental cognitive psychology at the Collège de France. Originally a mathematician, he has turned his interest to neuroscience and psychology for our great pleasure. Director to the INSERM CIA, Cognitive Neuroimaging Unit, he has been working in cognitive neuroscience, focusing his research on understanding the brain mechanisms of cognitive functions specific to the human species, such as reading, mathematics, syntax, and conscious reasoning. reasoning. He uses a multidisciplinary approach, combining behavior paradigms, neuropsychological studies of patients with brain lesions, and brain imaging studies. Known for his work on the number sense and the visual word form area, he has received numerous awards and prizes. Of greatest relevance, he was the recipient of the Brain Prize, the most prestigious prize in neuroscience. He has authored countless articles in the most, most important scientific journals, as well as books on numerical cognition, on reading, and on consciousness. All have been translated in several languages. His work has not only had a transformative impact on the field of cognitive neuroscience and our understanding of the human mind, but has also reached the general audience. But before uh, I hand the microphone over, I want to share an anecdote. Dr. Dan asked me when we met the first time. Well, I was a graduate student and I do remember quite distinctly. It was in a wonderful setting in the Alps in Italy, actually the Dolomites in Italy, and we were wearing our boots and our skis. And I was following my then mentor, Dr. Zorzi, on a ski ride. And he was chatting in the beautiful setting with Dr. Dehan about science. Unfortunately, I don't remember what wonderful breakthrough they might have done in that setting. <laughs> but I do remember one thing. If you go skiing with Dr. Dehan, be ready. He's an excellent skier. <laughs> so now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dehan, and I'll leave the work. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in one of the most important labs working on the origins of language and uh, one of the most important universities contributing to this question. Um, I would like to um, ask today the question, how languages are organized in the brain? And I want to put languages in the plural because I think there are multiple languages in the brain and we want to understand how humanity different from other primates, was able to acquire not only spoken language, but also written language, mathematics, music, all of these wonderful abilities that define us as a species. And what you see here is a fresco. It's part actually of a 20 meters long fresco in our building that was designed by this gorgeous artist, Marietta Ren. And um, she visited the lab and she got the idea, you know, we want to understand why this brain, the baby's brain, is able to acquire language, and this brain, which is about the same size, is not able to acquire language. And uh, a classic hypothesis in the field, dating from Noam Chomsky, Mark Hauser, Tecumseh Fitch, is that um, our brain is able to create tree structures. We, when we describe a sentence, like the sentence, happy linguist make a diagram, we um, are actually expressing not just a sequence, but actually, internally, it is coded as a tree structure. 
There is an operation called merge, according to this hypothesis, which takes two words, can create a noun phrase. And another group of two words may make another noun phrase, and then they combine together to make a verb phrase, and then a sentence. So this merge operation, according to this, is what is truly unique, because it is a recursive operation that allows us to build the three structures of language. But, uh, and it's not enough to talk about sequence or about transition probabilities. There is more to that than uh, just uh, transition probabilities in human language. Um, now, nested structures are also present in the other languages of the brain. In equations, for instance, such as this mathematical equation, or in music, people agree that the proper description is also one where there are nested structures, three structures, phrases inside phrases inside phrases. And I think you can see that in mathematics due to the parentheses. So the question we'll be asking today, we'll be asking two questions. The first question is, um, can we monitor, can we begin to understand the neural code for the constituent structures of language and of sentences? And the second question, is this network shared between mathematics and language, or are there different networks for different human abilities, although they both involve a sort of language? So I'll start with the first question, the neural code for the constituent structures of sentences. I am very excited by this question. I think there is a very deep mystery here. Something changed in the human brain that allows us to do language in a way that other species do not. So we started to work question with Christophe Pallier and Anne-Dominique de Vaucher. And this is one of the, I think, uh, experiments that we did that shed some light on the problem, um, where the idea was very simple. If there is an operation that takes several words and combines them to get a merge operation, then there should be more activity in the brain when there is more instances of this operation. So at the bottom here, you have just a list of words, 12 words that are unrelated and the list is random, it's worse than random. It's designed so that the words cannot be combined with each other, uh, one, one after the other. If you move now to this condition, we have also 12 words, but now they can be combined in groups of two. Looking ahead, who dies, important task, his dog, few holes they write, okay? So groups of two. Then we can have groups of three, groups of four, groups of six, and all the way to a full sentence. And so what we did was we scanned subjects while they were seeing this and found that the whole network of areas in the left hemisphere whose activation increases monotonically with the number of merge of, if you like, with the size of the constituent structures that were present in the stimulus. In all of these cases, the subjects are seeing 12 words. So the stimulus is very well controlled, it's 12 words. But because there are internal operations uh, that are more complex for a sentence than for a list of words, you see this increasing activation occurring in four different sectors of the superior temporal sulcus, as well as in different sectors of Broca's area here. Okay. So I think this is the core network for language. There was also an activation in the putamen, in the basal ganglia, that I will talk about a bit, a bit later. So you see this activation climbing monotonically as a function of structure. This is the list of words. This is the sentence, one word, 12 words. You can see the activation climbing monotonically very nicely in all of these regions. Uh, one thing, this is a log scale. And I'll come back to that. The effect is a function of the log of the number of words that are merged together. Initially, we did not understand it. I think now we begin to understand it. I'll tell you why. Um, but I want to tell you that there is a sub-network, which is shown in red here, which has a more particular function in syntax. This is because oops, we did this second experiment where we did this same sort of manipulation, but now using this condition called Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky, we take a, word, a sentence and we replace the words, the content words, by pseudo-words. So it begins to be nonsense. I perceive that you should be get the tropufol of your true viral rate. This is meaningless. But you get the idea that you can still do the syntax. You can parse this sentence because we kept the grammatical words and the morphology. And uh, we can also have, of course, the one 
word or one pseudo word condition down here and all of the intermediate conditions. When we scan subjects with this manipulation, we find that only the network in red was staying. So you can see some areas drop completely. For instance, the temporal pole here climbs when it's normal sentences, but remains completely flat with this Jabberwocky stimuli. So this area does not care about syntax. It can no longer be activated if uh, the meaning is gone. Okay? But other areas, like maybe this PSTS here, or areas of broker's area, they continue to show the same sort of activation with the same slope, regardless of whether it's Jabberwocky or meaningful sentences. So we think that these areas form the core of a syntax network. This finding, difference between sentences and word list and intermediate level, is very classical in fMRI these days. We've replicated it. So on the left here, what you see is what I just shown you, the written language study with the areas in red activating in proportion to constituent size, more and more, all the way up to the sentence, also broker's area. You see that other areas show the inverse effect. Okay? But I focus on the areas in red. Now you see we replicate with spoken language. If we present words one by one, but now they are spoken, we string them together in the same way. It's a bit artificial sentence, but it's still, you can understand the sentence in a spoken modality. We still get this effect. So it's very clearly a network which is supramodal, not auditory, not visual, but both. Um, it's very interesting to ask whether this network is completely universal. And we think that there is universality in language processing. So we did our first and only constituent size study in uh, sign language. And I wanted to tell you about sign language here, although I barely dare to speak because this is not at all my specialty sign language here. But um, we created stimuli and we s uh, scanned 20 adults that were native sign language speakers um, of French sign language. So now we used movies to present series of signs forming either a full sentence of eight signs, two groups of four, four groups of two, or just a list of eight individual signs. So I want to show you a movie. Of course, this is in French sign language, so it may, you will probably not understand it, but you'll get the idea. So we have eight signs. Here they are meaningless one after the other, it's a list. Now it's groups of two. I don't know if you can see that, probably not because it is French sign language, but I think you get the idea. Now, in order to create this stimulus and have no artifact, uh, we just strung together eight videos, okay, of individual signs. And I think it's a little bit of a problem in that study because we removed a lot of the cues that make a valid sentence. Uh, it's really like a list of words, but they belong together enough that the subjects told us they could understand the sentence. But I think we removed a lot of the cues and that may explain why we get a little bit impoverished activation. I'll show you in a second. Um, but so this is the design. We present either sign language. It's an event-related design, so a single sentence. And when we move to the next trial. Or we also subjects who all could read. So we also presented sentences versus lists of words in French. Okay? So we could compare the French network and the uh, sign language network. So this is an fMRI study. And uh, I just want to show you the main results. So here are all the 20 subjects. And this is the network that we found when they were reading French. So this is a wonderful replication of our previous study. You can see very, very clearly all of this superior temporal sulcus activation and Broca's area activation proportional to uh, constituent size and therefore here showing a difference between sentence versus word list. On the left, you see what we got for sign language, a mild activation in the same spots. We were a little bit disappointed it's low activation. There was a very strong activation, however, in the basal ganglia that you can see here. Again, all of this proportional to uh, the uh, constituent size, so showing this linear monotonic effect. The effects were still there, uh, and it's important. When we selected subgroups of subjects, either who had sign language before the age of five, or an even smaller subgroup of subjects who had sign language from birth. 
As you know, uh, at, and certainly in France, people are not always exposed to sign language from birth. It was impossible for us to find a large group of people who were exposed right from birth. But in that study, at least, uh, which of course we were scanning young adults, it didn't seem to make much of a difference. But we had to go to regions of interest. And um, what we did here is we analyzed all of the regions of interest that we had found before in our study and that we had uh, found in the very same subjects here when they were reading uh, French. And so we looked at whether these regions that were responding to French, so you can see here, for instance, each of these regions has more activation to the C12 condition, which is the sentence, compared to the C1 condition, which is the list of words. And then we could see what is it doing in sign language from C1 to C8, so more and more constituent structure. And I hope you can see that there is always a significant, although small effect, of the constituent structure of sign language in these areas that care about written language. Um, so we were satisfied to see this because it suggests that there is indeed a universal network regardless of whether it's sign language or written language, that activates uh, here in proportion to constituent size. And uh, I should say that there are, um, so I, I draw this conclusion, the cortical circuit for language is universal across spoken and sign languages. On the basis of our work alone, I think this conclusion will be moderate. But I think there are many other studies out there, including this very nice work, for instance, by Elisa Newport and Daphne Bavelier, where they show very clearly that people who master sign language if present natural sign language, you can activate exactly the same areas uh, once again. And I think our stimulus was a bit impoverished, maybe explaining why we get these slightly smaller effects. Um, the putain is a very interesting region, and it is an outcome of that study to show that if there is one area which is very strongly common, it is this subcortical region. I will not spoke more about it in this talk, but keep this in mind. Maybe an important net part of the language network is this subcortical region, especially the left putamen. Uh, there is evidence that FOXP2, one of the important genes for language, is uh, expressed and uh, modulates plasticity in animals in this region, and also Huntington's disease patients. Uh, who have trouble in the basal ganglia, have trouble learning rules of language. So well, I wonder whether this is a neglected part of the language network. Um, but for the rest of my talk, like everybody else, I will continue to focus on the cortex. Okay. So um, I just wanted to show you that there are many converging pieces of evidence for this core network for the manipulation of syntactic trees. So this is the image I just shown you. But I want to show you, maybe I'll put them all on screen, uh, all of these studies that point to the same sort of core network for syntax processing. For instance, this is a study we just completed two years ago, again with Christophe Pallier. Um, if we ask subjects to manipulate the tree, to create a tree structure, but to manipulate it. So for instance, uh, I tell you a sentence. The kids who exhausted their parents fell asleep. Who fell asleep? The kids or their parents? Okay. Well, I hope you know it's the kids. Notice that you read literally in a sequence, their parents fell asleep. Okay. But that's the wrong answer. You know what is the right answer by manipulating the tree structure, and you know that the subject of fell is the kid. Okay. When you do that, you manipulate tree structures in your head, and you get this very strong activation, again, in the PSTS, or uh, middle temporal gyrus in the posterior part, and then the inferior frontal region, pars triangularis in particular. Uh, so this network seems to be involved when you construct the tree and when you manipulate the tree. And for instance, also when there is syntactic movement, when you make a question of a relative sentence, when there is syntactic ambiguities, when people have brain lesions and they lose activation in this area, they develop agrammatism and of course sign language. So all of these are indications of a core network for language processing and especially for syntax processing. Now, we wanted to go beyond that and ask how the constituents are encoded. fMRI will not tell us the code. It's too slow, it's too imprecise. Um, so we went to another method which involves intracranial recordings. Having hundreds of electrodes inside the brain of, of course, very particular people who are epileptic and in whom we can record from electrodes deep inside the brain for clinical reasons. 
So we're not asking for volunteers for implanting electrodes in the brain. No. So our hypothesis is very simple. When there is a tree structure in a sentence, this allows you to compress the information. So here is the sentence that we presented to the subjects. Bill Gates met two very tired dancers in Dallas. It's a little bit funny sentence because we generate them by the computer. So there is a program that generates thousands of such sentences. Um, and in this way, we can control the tree structure. Well, our idea is the following. When you get Bill, you have to wait. When you get Bill Gates, you say, oh, that's a constituent. I can close it and I can make a node out of it. It's just one node now. I get met too, very tired. Ah, very tired. That's another constituent. I can make a node out of it. And then dancers, oh, very tired dancers. Two very tired dancers. Met two very tired dancers. All of these collapsed together can be compressed into what linguists call a constituent. So our idea is that there should be moments in time like here, like here, at the end of a sentence also, when you create these nodes, these tree structures. And we expect it to find activity which follows this parsing of the sentence. So um, this is what we uh, predicted. Uh, I will not go much into the more detail. We recorded from several hundreds of uh, depth electrodes. The task of the subject was to see such a sentence, word by word, presented in rapid serial visual presentation. and then there would be a gap of two seconds, and then they would get an ellipsis version of the sentence. So, 10 sad students of Bill Gates should often sleep. They should. Okay. And you have to say yes, because the ellipsis matches the sentence. Maybe you would get it will, and then you know this has no relation to the previous sentence. So the reason we adopted this particular task, deciding whether the ellipsis fits or does not fit, with the sentence is that it forces you to parse the sentence and hold it in mind for a few seconds without being difficult. It's a very natural task. But it requires you to uh, attend to the sentence and attend to its entire structure. We compare that as usual to a word list condition. Dallas, George, Fat, Should, Of, Proud, Really, Two, Things, and so on. Okay. So what did we find? This is the beauty of intracranial recordings. So what you see here is so-called high gamma activity, shown in colors. So an index of activation of neural networks as a function of time, locked on the first word. And you see all of the sentences here and all of the word list. Each line is one. And this is really the, the unusual aspect of this, is you can get signal on individual trials. I hope you can see that this electrode is tracking the length of the sentence. So three words, four words five words, all the way to 10 word sentences. You can clearly see the activation starts somewhere near the beginning and lasts until the end and a bit more. Okay. So it's tracking the sentence. And this is not the case for the list of words, so it creates a significant difference. There is more activation going up for longer and longer sentences and not for the word list here. Okay. That's a first phenomenon that was also reported recently by F. Fedorenko and other collaborators. So there's something building up. Okay. Now, um, if we look at the end of the sentence, we can see this much more clearly. I hope you can see that after this last word, there's much more activation when there was a long sentence before it. So there was something building up before it. And we can map this entire effect at the whole brain level. So whether we compare the sentence ending to a word preceding it in the middle, or whether we do a regression for the last word on sentence length, we get all of these electrodes in red show this effect. Okay. So we can begin to make a map of which areas are involved in this sort of syntactic effects. And you can see that uh, we get effects all along the superior temporal region or middle temporal region here, Broca's area, and also some more dorsal sites. I'll come back to that in a second. We think that this could be a neural correlate of the sentence wrap-up effect, which is a selective slowing of reading time on the last word of a sentence. When you reach the last word of a sentence, you are typically slowing. And this could be because you have a lot of work to do, which is indexed by this activation. But our study is nice also because we can look inside the sentence. You see, we have all of this activity inside the sentence. And so that was our next goal. What happens inside? So here you see the very same sentences. They've been sorted, but now sorted by the size of the first constituent. 
So this could be Bill Gates or the doctor, two words here. And this is the end of the first constituent, the subject. You can have three words or you can have five words or you can have six words here. And I hope you can see that the gamma activity is peaking sometime at the moment of the end of the constituent, okay? And then it's decreasing again. So this is something we found in this particular electrode. Here is an example, 10 students, you see the activation rising and then it falls. And then of course, the sentence continues. Um, 10 sad students, it goes up and up and then it falls, okay. 10 sad students of Bill Gates, suddenly it rises again. And you get the same thing with 10 students, 10 students of Bill Gates here. So the activation is tracking the constituent by going up and then falling at the end of the constituent. And this, reflects, this is reflected in a very simple effect. If you lock on a word, with zero being the onset of the word, the number of open nodes, the number of words or constituents that have not yet been closed together is predictive of the amount of gamma activity. And this is our best picture of where, where this is going on. I was very pleased to see, you see, it's not the whole brain. It's a large extent of the brain, but it is precisely the language circuits that we showed you in the previous slides, in the fMRI. So uh, STS and middle temporal gyrus, inferior uh, frontal region, pars triangularis here, and some more dorsal regions, precentral region, area 55, has been described in fMRI as well. Some sensory motor cortex, which may have to do with the larynx, having to produce the sentence, maybe subjects are internally producing covertly, and also some midline supplementary motor area. So all of these areas are showing this parsing effect. Some of them may have to do with the core syntax, some may have to do with the meaning. We also found that at the moment of closing, some regions, particularly the IFG, were showing an additional burst of activity at the time of the constituent closure, the merge and it was proportional to constituent length. So you see at the end of the sentence, for instance, here, uh, when you close five nodes, you have more activity than when you close three or four or one or two. And the same inside, a constituent inside the sentence here, you gain activation proportional to the number of nodes being closed. So there is an additional burst. This could be the areas that are involved in the actual act of closing the constituent. Um, now, uh, what I love about this study is it allows us to ask questions about the organization of language. So, for instance, there is a very clear um, uh, implicit hypothesis in our work, which is the concept of total number of open nodes, which assumes that a single word and a multi-word phrase, if they are merged, contribute the same amount to total brain activity. And up to now, I've been showing you regressions of brain activity based on this notion of total number of open nodes. And this is very implicit in the notion of merge by Noam Chomsky, this operation that applies to all linguistic objects regardless of their complexity. Whether you merge one word or whether you merge a whole constituent that has already been built, it's the same merge operation. Okay? So uh, can we test this idea? Well, I think we can in our study because for the moment I've shown you this effect of the total number of open nodes here, but we can track the number of pending words versus the number of closed constituents. So if you get Bill Gates, it's two pending words, but then suddenly you can pass them together and make one close constituent. And likewise, when you reach very tired dancers, very tired belong together, you can decrease the number of pending words because you are closing a constituent. So we made the regression using these two variables here. But the finding was we don't need two variables. So one variable is enough. So what we are finding here is that each dot is one electrode and what you are seeing is the weight of the number of pending words and the weight of the number of closed constituents. So this variable and this variable. But they are related by a slope of one. And this slope is not uh, barely different from one. It's just a bit higher. So it means that these areas weight in the same manner one closed constituent and one simple word. A word and a closed constituent weight the same. Uh, the brain compresses phrases almost down to the size of a single word. I hope you get the idea. Um, now, uh, there are other linguists who have said, we don't need trees. Uh, some linguists claim that nested tree structures are unnecessary and that sequential transition probabilities are sufficient 
to explain the organization of language. I think they are not the majority these days, but there are still people, a little bit like Skinner in the 1950s, try to explain language just by transition between one word and the next. And, um, well, we know that transition probabilities do affect brain activity. Uh, there are sequential measures of syntactic and lexical entropy which have been shown to modulate behavior or also brain activity. Like in the N400, when you get an N400 waveform, it reflects the surprise, the improbability of one word compared to the preceding ones. So certainly probability effects should not be neglected. So we try to test this notion of pure transition probability-based models, entropy and surprisal, either at the single word level or at the category level, entropy of the transitions between, let's say, the category of noun and the category of verb or determiner. And we tried many of these, and we found that they can account for some brain activity. So this is our best model for surprisal. This is the surprise induced by a word as computed with using Google two grams here, Google n grams. And you can see that this posterior middle temporal gyrus site is sensitive to surprise. And in fact, it's a very plausible site for the N400 effect. But the most important finding is that the rest of the language network does not uh, respond to this sort of surprise or entropy. You really require tree structures to account for this model. So we found that there is superiority of the open nodes model over transition probability in each of these areas, which are essentially the core of the language network. So we're not saying there is no effect of transition probability. I think the brain is a probabilistic machine, predicts the next words, but these effects are confined to some areas. The bulk of the work of language areas is based on trees, not on transition probabilities. So this is a summary of what we found. We found that brain activity does not merely increase with every new word, but with high enough temporal resolution, it also transiently decreases whenever a phrase building operation compresses several words into a single node. Okay. And I think this can explain what I showed you earlier, this log effect. So what we are finding is not a purely linear effect of increase of brain activity, but there is also a local decrease. And that means that the number of open nodes which drives brain activity is sublinear, is below this line of linearity as a function of the number of words in a sentence. And this is close to a log, closer to a log than to a linear. So we think it can explain what we saw before in fMRI when you integrate over uh, multiple words as you know, the ball signal in fMRI does, it integrates across an entire sentence. So um, this is where we are at the moment with respect to understanding coding in the language system. I think it's exciting. We have, not reached, re, we have not yet reached the stage where we understand the neural code for uh, sentential structures. This will require much more precise measurements at a single neural level, perhaps. But at least we begin to see the dynamics of constituent structure building. And for the moment, it is confirming, by and large, what the linguists have been claiming, that three structures are absolutely needed. Now, in the second half of my talk, I want to talk about mathematics. And this is my second question. Now that we know the language, now that we know the network for language in the brain, can we find that the same network is activated for mathematics or is it completely different? So there is no doubt that you need language for mathematics. So Galileo said the book of the universe is written in the mathematical language. The symbols are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures without whose help it is impossible to comprehend the single word of it. So it is a language, but which language? Okay. How does mathematical language lead to natural language? Here there are diverging views. According to Noam Chomsky, everything comes from language. Mathematical capacity lies in an abstraction from linguistic operations. So something changed in our ability to communicate with others, and this allowed us to do mathematics. Language was first, natural language, and everything else derives from it. That's one hypothesis. But when you ask other people, like Einstein or many other physicists and mathematicians, that's not what they say. What they say is words and language, whether written or spoken, do not seem to play any part in my thought processes. The psychological entities that serve as bidding blocks for my thoughts are certain signs or images more or less clear 
that I can reproduce and recombine at will. So, according to Einstein, it is not natural language. It is something else. The vocabulary is completely different. So, who is right? You know, Chomsky or Einstein? This is a big fight. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you the truth, but I have my own idea. Uh, of course, it, take it with a grain of salt. But uh, I published this book called The Number Sense with this idea, which I think is much closer to Albert Einstein's, that we owe our mathematical ability to a pre-verbal, non-verbal sense, a sense of number, and also other senses, a sense of space, a sense of time. And our mathematical abilities are founded upon these very old pre-verbal abilities, which predate language. And of course, we formalize these intuitions using a hierarchy of symbols, but these symbols remain attached to the underlying non-symbolic, non-verbal core semantic systems. So according to this view, uh, mathematics should be attached to non-verbal systems, not to the verbal system of natural language. So um, we did an experiment to try to ask these questions. The experiment was very simple, but I think it was the first of its kind. We decided we should scan high-level mathematicians. Um, so, we recruited professional mathematicians, 15 of them, and we compared them with of humanities. Um, this was a very difficult comparison. We had to find matched uh, equivalents to the mathematicians. So, we see in the paper processes of humanities of matched academic standing, but without mathematical training. I let you judge if this is possible or not to match them. I, all I can say is they had the same salaries. So, what we did was we asked them to perform a fast, intuitive judgment on spoken statements. We wanted to prove their intuitions of mathematics. So, they heard a sentence, they had four seconds to think about it, and then they had to respond. Is this true? Is this false? Or is it meaningless? Is it gibberish? Okay? So, as one example of a sentence, you might hear uh, something like, every matrix is a is equivalent to a permutation matrix. Every matrix is equivalent to a permutation matrix. Is it true or is it false? Is it meaningless? So you, I don't know if you are mathematicians. If you are a mathematician, it's quite easy to say it's true. It's actually, I was trained as a mathematician. Even I know this, you know. It's, I didn't become a really good mathematician. We also ask much more difficult facts, and so the performance was about 70% correct. In here. We also asked, um, an, general knowledge questions in history and geography that did not make use of mathematics or numbers. For instance, um, in ancient Greece, a citizen who couldn't pay his debts was made a slave. True or false? Okay. You can think for four seconds, your knowledge of Greece, uh, citizens, yes, there were citizens and slaves, you could move from one category to the next, I was told that in school, uh, and the answer is yes, it's true, Okay, apparently. <laughs> so, it's interesting, right? You hear a sentence, you think, you bring your knowledge together, but is it the same for mass and for non-mass? Okay. In order to compare with networks that we know already, we also had subjects calculate, for instance, please compute 7 minus 3, and we also had uh, subjects view a lot of pictures, bodies, tools, faces, houses, but also words, numbers, and equations, fragments of equations. Of course, when you're a mathematician, you specialize in reading this equation. So we mapped the mathematician's brain. And the first finding was extremely clear. When you listen to these statements and you begin to think about them, if they are in mathematics, a whole network shows up, shows up only for the mathematical statements. So you can see whether it's analysis or algebra, topology or geometry, all of these sentences speaking about showed up and create this strong activation, bilateral parietal cortex, bilateral inferior temporal cortex, dorsal, middle, and superior frontal areas. Going down a little bit into inferior frontal gyrus, but this is really the dorsal part of area 44 here. And all of these areas show a very strong activation for mass, but not for the control sentences. And furthermore, they only activate in the mathematicians. So these are the mathematicians I already showed you. These are the control subjects. Of course, they cannot tell the difference between 
the meaningful mathematical sentences and the others. They don't activate this network. So they create this interaction here. Uh, now, there is another network for general semantic knowledge, which activates areas that are completely different. You can see them in green now. So bilateral posterior STS and angular gyrus, or temporal parietal junction here. Anterior temporal regions of the middle uh, temporal gyrus and temporal pole here, bilateral again, and these very, very mesial frontal components. All of these areas shoot up for the general knowledge questions, the non-mass, but they remain very low or even deactivate for the mathematical statements. So two completely different networks. And now, of course, we all have the green network, right? Even if you're not a mathematician, you still activate this network for general semantics. It's been described already in the past, for instance, by Jeff Binder. And there are several experiments on the semantic system. But somehow, the mass system is different. Um, in the previous slide, of course, there could not be an intersection. Either it's more active for mass than for non-mass, or it's more active for non-mass than for mass, but it cannot be both, OK? So in a certain sense, the fact that there is no intersection is trivial. But um, in this, we can do something else here. What we can do is we can compare meaningful mass versus meaningless mass, OK? And we can compare meaningful non-mass versus meaningless non-mass. So meaningful sentences are the one I gave you. Meaningless sentences, a little bit like Jaworoki. We mix words together. It sounds like mathematics, but it's not mathematics. So when mathematicians hear this, they begin to activate the network, but then they stop. Okay. And that's the light blue curve here. You can see it here as well. But when it's real mathematics, they continue and they have to think and solve the problem. Okay. So by doing this subtraction, we still get our blue network. We also get our green network, which is meaningful non-mass versus meaningless non-mass. But the two networks don't intersect. It's basically the same areas as before, no intersection. Okay. So completely different systems for general semantics versus mathematics. Um, what does the language system per se do? Well, either it shows exactly the same activation. This is much more transient activation to the uh, sentences themselves, to the statements you can see here. Or, if anything, they activate more for the non-mass. They don't show this strong activation beyond the sentence itself. And it's very, very clear that language and mathematical areas are distinct. In red, you see the network of areas activated by spoken language. And uh, in yellow, you see the mathematical areas. They are really contouring almost perfectly, like a completely different system. Now, what is this math network? Well, in fact, we've known these areas for a little while. They are those that are involved already in all of us without being a mathematician in number processing and in calculation. So this is in the very same subjects. This is the mathematicians doing math, ventral temporal cortex and bilateral parietal cortex. This is when the same people do just viewing of numbers compared to other pictures. And this is when they do calculation compared to sentence processing. In each of these contrasts, we get the same sort of networks. They overlap very significantly. They are, in fact, very, very similar, even within subjects. So, Mathematics is making use of the same networks that we all have, maybe very early on, in order to do number and calculation. This is very compatible with this recycling idea. So we knew about parietal areas for number sense for a long time now, these bilateral parietal systems. And more recently, um, this may be less familiar to you, but it's been discovered by Joseph Parvizi in particular, that there are also ventral sites that care about number. This has become a very important part of the number network. We may have missed it earlier because fMRI had an artifact in this region. But now that MRI has become better, we see it all the time. This into calculation. So there is a mass network. And what, what is happening is that the mathematicians seem to be reusing this network in order to bring it to another level. More complex equations, very abstract facts, complex mathematics. So we saw that in the ventral visual system. Here, you remember we bombarded these mathematicians with all sorts of images, checkers, faces, bodies, tools, formulas, numbers, and, and words. And you see this mosaic of preferences. So for instance, in red, you see the response to faces. This is a fusiform face area in the right hemisphere, a little bit in the left hemisphere. So mathematicians 
are similar to controls in this respect, except they have expanded areas, and in particular, there's an expansion of the responses to formulas and to numbers. So you can see in blue here, this is the response to numbers in a non-mathematician control subject. You see left and right number responsive areas and a small response to formulas in green. Okay? But in mathematicians, these responses have become much larger, much more intense as well. There's been an expansion of these areas, uh, not just for numbers, but also expanding into a representation of mathematical formulas. Okay? So, um, I think this is very characteristic of this recycling model. We start with a small preference for simple objects, such as the numerosity of a set of dots. But if you, your education, your culture brings you to the next level, continue to use the same circuits to build upon them for higher levels. Now, I can't resist to show you one small thing. Um, this is what happened in the other direction. Did we lose anything? when we learn mathematics? Is there cortical competition? So is there any area of the brain that has a negative correlation? The more you are a mathematician, the less it's being activated. Well, we found one, it is for faces. <laughs> and it means that you have less activation in the right fusiform face area, in part of it at least. It's not a appearance, of course, but a reduction of this activation when you are a mathematician compared to a normal subject, to a normal subject. I shouldn't say that, <laughs> compared to a control subject. So, uh, well, I think uh, we don't know what this means exactly, this result, um, but we have been finding several cases that the face system competes with cultural acquisitions. In the case of reading, when we learn to read, the face system is moving. We have shown that in several studies. It's moving to the right hemisphere. In the case of mathematics, it seems that we are learning a much more bilateral system of numbers and this seems to compete bilaterally with faces and ultimately reducing the activation to faces. Um, I should warn you that we don't know whether this has any behavioral consequences. Um, so this is where we are now, although we all know some mathematicians, right? Um, I am a mathematician, so I can say that. So uh, maybe face processing is one of the challenges uh, here of uh, being a mathematician. Um, all of this is for future work to prove, but this was an incidental finding that I thought I should report. Um, okay, so I go back to uh, our main finding, just to say that this is a highly reproducible thing. So this is the thing I showed you, and which we have published already. These are two more experiments now. Oops. Two more experiments. We're using also mathematicians, but much simpler facts. We were using uh, an immediate response, sentences that are easy enough that you hear it and you say, oh yes, okay, a matrix is invertible or not, okay. Or in the last one here, it's so simple, it is just declarative statements with the is, with the copula. So X is Y. For instance, I'll give you an example, true or false. The sine function is periodical. Yes, okay, we all know that, okay. Or the Penguin is an animal. Okay. Or the penguin is a bird, maybe a little bit more difficult. Okay. This sort of questions. It feels we're doing the same thing twice, right? We're just accessing the definition, and then we're saying yes. Well, nevertheless, the networks are very different once again. So I think there's something very fundamental that the semantics of mathematics and the semantics of general knowledge belong to different brain networks. Um, there is a lot of converging evidence for a dissociation between language and mathematics, and I think I'll just mention it briefly. First of all, these networks are very replicated in studies of intracranial recording. So again, Joseph Parvizi's team is doing beautiful work. So if you calculate, you activate the electrodes in uh, uh, pink here, and if you uh, do language processing, you have to retrieve facts from your general knowledge or from your self-knowledge, you activate these areas in green here double dissociation. Um, deeply aphasic patient may still process mathematics. This is even more surprising, I think. So you can be a deeply aphasic and agrammatic patient. You have lost the ability to uh, combine words together to create sentences and to understand these, but you may still be able to do A squared minus B squared is equal to A minus B times A plus B. I know this is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I find it extraordinary. It means that the three structures of algebra 
may remain preserved even if the three structures of grammar uh, are, seem to have been impaired. And we have other pieces of evidence for a dissociation between natural language and mathematics in the sense of mere intuition. So people who have very reduced lexicon for mass concepts, such as the munduruku, who have number words only up to five, may still be able to have intuitions of large numbers and of geometry as long as it does not require a precise, exact proof. They have intuitions. They have the approximate knowledge of these mathematical concepts and for evidence of arithmetic intuitions even in pre-verbal infants and even in monkeys. I will not have time to detail that, but some of you, like Ilaria, know a lot about that. Um, so, with this idea in mind, I'll tell you where uh, my work is going. My work is trying to simplify this now, not using these super high-level mathematical concepts, but using very, very simplified, but still mathematical languages that we can describe as mathematical. And maybe some of them are so simple that they can be taught in a few minutes to a young child, okay? So this is what we are aiming for. And then what we would like to do is present them to a monkey and be able to compare the monkey with the young child and to see whether, in fact, both learn it equally well or maybe there is something very special about the human compared to the monkey. So we're starting to do this. I want to show you one of the languages we're using. Um, this is, uh, we've turned it into a little game for young children. So this is for preschoolers. We tell preschoolers, okay, there are eight locations here and there is a little fish. His name is Bloop and he likes to hide. So he's going to hide in different places and you have to predict where he's going, okay? Where is the next place where he will go? So let me show you and we'll see if you can do it as well as preschoolers. Okay, where is, where is the fish going next? Here? And then here? And then here? You got it right. <laughs> now, think about it. I mean, you didn't even get the full sequence. You only got the beginning. You got almost nothing here, but you got enough information to pick up the structure, which is like a zigzag structure, right? Um, now, there are many other possible structures I could have shown you, and we've done a sort of exhaustive study, and we find that in order to account for what you are doing here, we need a sort of language. There is a sort of implicit programming language, like a computer, that describes what you are doing. You are repeating a symmetry operation several times, starting at different locations. That's what the zigzag is about, right? It's grouping by two, something like that. So we need primitives, and we also need a sort of language that allows us to say we need to repeat the horizontal operation four times as we are going through the, the screen here. So, and there might be even more complicated combinations like two rectangles here. Okay, that's one rectangle and that's another. In order to describe that sequence, you need to have this sort of language. So we run this experiment. I think I will not have time to go into details just to show you that, well, maybe I show you the four segments data here. So um, in the background, you have what happens with a random sequence. We shouldn't call it random. It's one without any geometrical regularity. It's one of maximal complexity in our language. Kids learn, but very, very slowly. This is the first part, and then we repeat a second time, okay? And they have to predict. This is what happens with this zigzag sequence in black. The zigzag, even on the fourth item, or the fifth, or the sixth, which I show you, you're already super good. You know what's coming next. This is your favorite interpolation. And then when we repeat, you can repeat the whole thing almost perfectly. This is in adults. It's the same in young children. It's the same for all of these regularities. This is the most important graph. The performance, the percentage of errors, is predicted by what we call complexity minimal description length. Minimal description length is also known as Kolmogorov complexity. It is the length of the shortest program that captures a given sequence. So in other words, a short description, short program in this language of thought, you have good capacity to understand the sequence, you have good capacity to memorize it this notion of compression again. The brain is compressing the information. If the information is compressible, you have better memory. If the information is not compressible, it's a complex sequence. That's what we call a complex sequence. And you have bad memory and bad ability to predict the rest of the sequence. 
This is true in French adults, it's true in French children, it's true also in the Munduruku. It does not seem to depend on education. We have a sequence here, or a, a test, which is so simple that you don't really need to have natural language and high-level education in maths to understand this. But it's already involving a language. So there are many interesting things we can do with this. We can replicate this work without any instruction. Just look at this sequence, move your eyes, which is very, very natural. Move to the next item with your eyes. But of course, if you understand the sequence, you're not just moving, you're anticipating. So your eye is going to the location even before it has appeared. So here we measure the amount of anticipation as we present one and then two and three and four instances of the same sequence. You can see the anticipations building up, and, but also already starting in the first part where there's been no repeat, better than uh, for a more complex sequence. Again, the amount of anticipation is predicted by the sequence complexity. So the brain is a compressor machine. Just like in the language part of my talk, I was showing you this compression by three structures. Here it's also compression by geometrical structures. Now we, we can do imaging of this task. And what is remarkable is once again, we find our mathematical network. We do not find our language network. We find this mathematical network whose activation is proportional to complexity. It's a, it's a broad network involving occipital parietal components, intraparietal sulcus, dorsal parietal cortex, and then dorsal precentral cortex, and even a little bit of you know, inferior frontal gyrus, but going only in the dorsal part of area 44. So uh, this is a network which is completely dissociated from the language network. We can use, in the very same subjects, we have localizer um, sequences for sentence processing and for calculation processing, okay? And if we look at the language network, it's not being activated at all by this geometrical task. If we look at the calculation network, it is being activated in each of these regions, and especially in the affair of frontal gyrus in the dorsal part, we have this notion of an increase very clearly, specifically for the more complex uh, sequences. So it looks as if, once again, we need a language for mathematics, but that language is not the same, or at least it's not the same brain areas as the language network. So this is an intermediate conclusion, I'm almost finished. I want to show you one more experiment. But first, very clearly, mathematics is a language, but that language does not appeal to classical language areas of the brain. Mathematics builds upon ancient, non-linguistic foundations, core knowledge of space, number, time, which are shared with many other animal species. Now we can still wonder what allows us humans to do mathematics. I think humans are special in at least two abilities. First to discretize representations using symbols, to move from an approximate to an exact representation of number, for instance. And second, to be able to combine these symbols productively, forming nested structures in the language of thought, as I just showed you for geometry. These might be the two things that have changed. We discretize, we combine the symbols into a mini language. And we do that in many domains. We do that in math. We do that in language. We probably do that in music and in other domains as well. Now I want to show you the last part of my talk is where are we going with this? Well, we have developed in the lab uh, the ability to do similar experiments in monkeys. This requires quite a lot of work, but now we have this well set up thanks to Bashir Jaraya, Wim van Duffel from Belgium, and Li Ping Wang who's a postdoc in the lab. We have the ability to take monkeys, put them the three Tesla scanner, while they are awake, they are attentive, they are not moving, and we just have them naive, just trained to fixate, remain quiet in the scanner, and exposed to simple rules. Now we start with auditory rules, so we haven't done the geometry task yet, we are working on that, but I want to show you one auditory experiment, which I think is speaking nicely. So same idea, we're going to show them a very simple rule and see if they grasp it. So in this case, um, I'm sorry I cannot play you the sound, but I think you'll get the idea. You have sounds that um, form a little pattern. Beep, 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 boop. Okay? So maybe three tones of a low frequency, and the fourth one is a different frequency. And we keep changing the frequencies. It can be three high, one low, three low, one high, 
three middle, one lower, and so on and so forth. The only rule which is constant here is there should be three, and then the last one is different. Okay. Very simple syntax. It's not even context-free grammar or nothing like that. It's a very simple mathematical rule, if you like. Now, we test the knowledge of the monkeys by presenting them deviants. First of all, we present them new exemplars that are the same rule again, three and then another one, but with different frequencies that were never used before. So they have to generalize. And I can tell you they always generalize. So their brain does not respond to this sort of stimuli. They've been adapted. But then we ask, do they react to a change of number? So if there is only two sounds, or if there is six sounds, will they react? Okay. That's a violation of the previous rule. We also violate the rule by changing the last item. Okay? So instead of expecting something different, now you have four identical sounds. This is intriguing, right? You're expecting something different, you get something which is as usual. Okay? And we can have double deviance, so violations in both number and in sequence. We scan both monkeys and humans. I'll go very quickly to say that we found that monkeys are sensitive to these rules. So we expose them for a few minutes to this rule, A, 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 B, A, 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 B, and then we present violations, A, B, violation of number. Um, they will react, and we found that there is a dorsal network that responds to number, in particular the intraparietal sulcus, which as we know responds to number, was activated in these monkeys. We also found that when we change the last item rule, when the last sound is not what you expect, so you expected something different and now you get something the same, or vice versa, the sequential structure was coded in another set of areas more involving a temporal lobe going into the anterior temporal regions and ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay? So monkeys are clever. They were picking the rule, they were picking some aspect of the rule, and they were reacting to violations in number and in sequence. But what we found is that they, they are very different from humans. When we scan humans in the same way, we find that, okay, they also have responses to numbers. Uh, for instance, I think it's in red. Here you can see intraparietal responses in humans to number change, our usual number network. We also have responses to sequence change, but what is very special in humans is they always activated the inferior frontal gyrus for both. And this is something we never found in a monkey. In a monkey, you have these different networks, but they don't intersect with each other. Okay. So um, I can show that to you in the following way. We're asking whether humans have the same pattern of activity for number and for sequence change. This is in the area of frontal gyrus here. They do. They have a significant correlation. Whereas in the monkey, if anything, it is a negative correlation. That is to say, if a voxel is activated by number, it is not activated by sequence and vice versa. Okay. So I'm going very fast because I don't have time anymore, but it, oh, oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but we'll try again. So it looks like monkeys have the features. They have number, they have sequence, they have the ability to detect elementary features of a sequence like that. But humans may form a more abstract representation of such a sequence. They seem to be using, if I go back to the previous slide, using bilateral areas in yellow here, IFG, as well as posterior superior temporal sulcus again, to encode something more abstract, something that will allow you to react to any change in the pattern. So um, we think that they may be building something like that. There is a first part where there is three tones. There is a second part where there is another one. And this is almost like a tree structure already. So if, if this hypothesis is correct, these areas are being used by humans even for extremely simple structures, such as A, 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 B, in order to begin to create tree structures that are similar to those that we find in language and in mathematics. So it looks like this inferior frontal gyrus broker's area is already quite different even when we stimulate the brain with very simple uh, auditory sequences. So I think I should conclude. I think I've told you that monkeys possess sophisticated capacity for representing number and sequence in auditory series, but only humans seem to possess cortical circuitry in the IFG and PSTS capable of integrating 
this information to form nested language-like structures. This is our hypothesis for the future work. And I want to mention one thing. In this talk, we've met with a certain convergence, but also the idea of parallel circuits, parallel circuits for language and for mathematics. Well, I think this is a hypothesis which is emerging in the field now, also in the work of Peter Haggard, for instance, that even inside language, we have to distinguish multiple parallel networks, each of which are organized to do unification or merge, something like this operation of tree structure building in the inferior frontal gyrus. So this is a slide I borrow from Peter Haggard, where you have multiple networks for phonological structures, for syntactic structures, and for semantic structures. And I have added to that slide another network for mathematical structures. I think we have to accept that it's not one network which is different in humans, but multiple networks that each seem to have this capacity to build three structures at different granularity levels in different domains, basically. So if this is true, we should be looking for something that has changed quite broadly in the cortex, maybe in the laminar structure of cortex, in the layers of cortex. Maybe something has changed in each of these areas. So this will be the work for the future. I'm stopping here by showing you the work, people who did the work. Christophe Pallier, my longtime collaborator on all of the language studies. Maria Malric for the mathematical work. Li Ping Wang for the monkey work. And Matt Nelson for the intracranial work. And thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for being long. <laughs> thank you. Do we have questions? Okay, just, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. We do have questions. I'm just giving a little bit of um, a preview what's happening next before so that people just don't disappear. So we're gonna take a few questions. We have time. Afterwards, I need everyone to um, fill in a questionnaire um, that the students need to fill in for us, please. And also uh, afterwards, we have a nice reception and everyone is welcome to join. But before, let's ask questions for um, anyone that wants to ask a question, please come on the stage and um, ask through the microphone or sign and our interpreters will be helping you. Don't hesitate. I have a question, then <laughs> I will open, and maybe this will spark um, questions uh, from everyone else. So I was interested in your um, last experiment that you did with preschoolers, the one of the geometrical language. Right. So uh, that task, you were also doing it with uh, e um, eye tracking. You were monitoring right. and predicting where the eye would go next. This could be a task done with younger kids that are preverbal. Yes. Right? With and this task seems to activate areas that are related to the math circuit. Hmm. Could that be a task of an early um, index of math learning disability? Would we, could oh, we, that's could we see great children question. not able to yeah. follow the pattern early on and detect them? Yeah. And um, that would give us maybe an indication? Well, that's a great question. I, I like this suggestion. I mean, so we only tested preschoolers at the age of five and six at the moment. So first we would have to see whether uh, you know, babies at an earlier age would be able to do the task. I remember Mike Posner was already doing uh, this sort of experiments and babies did track and anticipate, but only simple structures were tested. So we would have to see whether this sort of more complex structures can be anticipated by, by babies. Oh. And then I like your idea very much. Yeah. yeah, maybe just even two years old, two or three yeah, years right. old that sure. are just um, entering into the world of numbers no. and should stay still enough to, to follow yeah. more complex. Yes, and, and uh, you know what? I like this test also because it's not just on number. I think we have been focusing a little bit too much, and I'm guilty, uh, <laughs> on just the number concept as the pillar of mathematics. But I think these tasks make it, make it clear that you have to combine number also with space concepts and create these more complex structures. And I think this is closer to what's really neat for mathematics. Um, I never imagine that people would say, okay, number is the only foundation for mathematics. I think this is not right. Space is a just as equally important concept. So uh, it would, I like your suggestion. Maybe we have already in five years old, we would have a pretty good test of how, how well they are doing and how well they will do in the future in mathematics. 
track them down. Yeah. Dr. Fritz from Maryland, is that correct? Um, this is a marvelous lecture, and I, I uh, really enjoyed it immensely. The questions I have are three, okay? The first one is uh, to sort of do with this merge operation. So often when someone says something, uh, you let's say a question, you formulate a response before they finish their sentence. Ah. And the delay time between your, your answer and the end of their question is been shown to be almost about zero, millis zero mm -hmm. milliseconds, mm -hmm. very fast. So what that means is that you're not only doing a merge operation for the beginning of the sentence, but you're forming a model of how the sentence yes. is going to go. Yes. Then, while you're listening to the rest of the sentence, you're already formulating your, your answer. Yeah. So that suggests that there's a, a forward model, which is uh, something you didn't really talk about that much in relation to the merge operation. Right. So I was wondering it, whether you might say that there's a cognitive merge in addition to the linguistic merge operation mm -hmm. so that you're anticipating the direction of the, of the statement or the question. Well, I, I think what you are pointing to is the notion of prediction. Right. I think the, the capacity to predict is one of the very old abilities of the brain, not just the human brain, it's a very, yeah. very general uh, mm -hmm. capacity in all sensory systems and presumably in high level systems mm -hmm. as well. And so, yes, I think there is prediction right. in the language system. Right. Right. Um, the one thing that I would like to do is to be able to show that this prediction occurs at the level of trees. Ah. It's not at the level of single words. I think I showed yeah. that, that if, yeah. we, if yeah. we try to just make a system that predicts the next word based on the preceding word or the preceding two words, it's not a good model of sure. language. Sure. So, but the ability to predict entire tree structures, I think that would be uh, mm -hmm. expected from what we know about the brain. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we have added a code, a code for trees, but we have kept everything else, the ability yeah. of the brain to be a mm -hmm. forward predictor and to have surprise when these predictions are violated. So that would be my hypothesis. Yeah. It would be nice to test it, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I, I should say one thing, these sentences that we used in that study, the intracranial studies, they were designed to avoid this sort of complication. So there was a limited vocabulary and there was no way you could predict what would, what would come uh -huh. next. There were five possible words in any category. Right. So in a certain sense, we cancel to a large extent the ability to predict. Not mm. completely, but mm. uh, to some extent. Yeah. So I think we should do a new study now to specifically have predictable versus unpredictable mm. and surprise you know, conditions at the syntactic level. That would be mm. very interesting. So my two other questions are, with regard to the mathematicians, Suppose you ask them a question which involves another mathematician, like Carl Gauss lived in the 18th ah, century. Yeah. So does that mean that you capture, you get caught up in the mathematics network, or is that a general semantic knowledge? This is wonderful. This is yeah. exactly what we want to do. This is yeah. what we are starting now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, let me backtrack. Maybe I can show that. Well, yes. Um, yeah. So here you have this sort of temporal parietal junction activation here. Okay. And it was mainly activated by the general knowledge. But in fact, during the sentence, there was a little bit of a transient activation during the math. Okay? And we wondered what this is. And we have a hypothesis that this is exactly what you're saying. This is pragmatics. This is asking, you know, what should I answer? Or would, would, what would another mathematician answer? Or am I going to embarrass myself by giving the wrong answer? Or something like that. So something about the social, pragmatical concept context in which this sentence is being asked. And this region disappears completely when we ask simple facts, like is the sine function periodical? There is no notion of pragmatics there, it's just knowledge, you know, it's like that. Uh, no mathematician could think otherwise and so on and so forth. So we know it has disappeared in these new studies. Now we want to do exactly what you suggested. Um, and I think in many cases we will expect back and forth between the language network and the math network. In fact, in our study already, we start with a sentence, but then it goes very quickly to this mass network, right? So I think they would, they, we would expect some back and forth. Uh, this is exactly our research program. What's the minimal amount that will trigger one network or the other network? So we did one experiment. I went fast also, but um, in one of the three replications I showed, we tried quantifiers. 
So imagine you have natural language, but there is some. Okay, so some birds are penguins. Or something like that. Is it enough to trigger the language network? Because after all, it's logic or it's a quantification. Uh, we found that it's not enough to trigger the mathematics network. But uh, you said the set of all penguins is okay. inside of the set of all penguins. Right. That, that, yeah, yeah. that might change it, right? Or, or maybe if you use double negation, like not all penguins are not birds, okay? <laughs> then you begin to do all sorts of logic or something like that. So I think there will be a moment where it begins to be mathematics. And I also think these are very spontaneous networks. So uh, the same dissociation, by the way, is shown very nicely by uh, Jack Gallant in a situation where subjects are just sitting there listening to a radio show. So um, at the moment where there are numbers, measurements, kilometers, uh, these sort of things, uh, you activate the math network. So it's there in natural language in as much as you have to bring mathematical operations. Yeah. The, the last thing I wanted to mention was, uh, I was really intrigued by your animal work mm -hmm. and the monkey studies. Um, so as you probably know, uh, there were some experiments by Sally Boysen yeah. with chimpanzee where she showed that if they had to do a greater than operation and they had to give, uh, they had to choose the smaller number of jelly beans for them and point to the small number of jelly beans in order to get the larger number of jelly beans, mm. okay? Then they couldn't do it unless the symbols were there. If it was the actual jelly beans, they couldn't perform the task. You know, it, if they had a symbol association, they could sort of dissociate themselves from the immediate gratification of getting the larger number yeah. of uh, rewards. So that suggests that that's an important leap forward in terms of being able to sort of conceptualize number. Mm. And uh, so I'm curious just to hear what you think about both these chimp experiments and, you know, for that matter, the experiments with monkeys where, and crows, by the way, where they can learn symbols for numbers and right. really show numerosity. Right. So, you know, well, are the same algorithms being used uh -huh. or are different algorithms being used in terms of brain uh, yeah. operation? So you're absolutely right. There are a number of experiments where animals have been trained to use symbols like Arabic digits. What has been done, in fact, is simply to allow them to associate Arabic digits with the corresponding numerosities. I don't think we should call that symbols. I think we have to clean up the literature a little bit. And basically, they are indices, indexes, indexicals. They, they point to a particular quantity. Um, they, the experiment you, said, you mentioned is quite nice, the Sally Boynton experiment. But it essentially shows that the symbols don't, ha don't convey the same immediate um, uh, response, basically. They all you to inhibit a little bit. But th this literature is also showing that animals are not learning to combine numbers in any sort of symbolic system. There's beautiful work, uh, it, it's really gorgeous, but so for instance, Margaret Livingstone has been showing that uh, animals can learn symbols, I shouldn't say symbols, uh, Arabic numbers, uh, and then they can do sort of an addition. But first of all, it took them 20,000 trials, and even after 20,000 trials, they're still not really doing addition. When you give them 20 plus 3, they give you something larger than 20. But it's not really 23. And they're not precise. Uh, they always approximate. So I think it's still very, very different from the way we process symbols. Uh, I think the discreteness and the combinations are missing. For your great question. I had I have lots of questions. I'll try to keep it really brief. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we, we see in early language acquisition is that children uh, naturally segment and categorize the linguistic stream. And so I was very um, fascinated in uh, this very exciting um, sh uh, show that the um, W about merge, and I was wondering what the relationship would be between categorization and merge, hmm. um, if uh, you might comment. And then I had another observation. Well, categorization, I think, is something older that many non-human primates certainly do, and maybe other animals as well, like chinchillas, right? There will be, uh, the, the brain will create borders between categories when it needs to create a border between categories. So there's been nice work by Earl Miller, for instance, uh, showing that monkeys can learn the sharp boundary between dogs and cats. 
And even if you, sh if you morph a, an image between a cat and a dog, they will impose a boundary. So I think in this respect, uh, categorization is something else. It's, it's an older capacity. Um, older in terms of cognitive theory or older in terms of? In terms of, of evolution. In evolution, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question is unrelated, um, but I'm very interested. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned in an, um, a somewhat humorous way that the mathematicians had uh, less of um, f facial recognition. Right, yeah. so, so a serious question, because we see it in other areas of cognition, is the fact that they became met, uh, mathematicians, um, uh, did what came first? The chicken, exactly, yeah, I chicken. should have said that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I usually say that, that we don't know the causal relationship here. Yeah. We didn't, you know, change these people. We took yeah. 15 but mathematicians. Yeah. We don't know whether they were to start with. Yeah. Um, so it's not a randomized controlled study. Yeah. Um, so there are these two possibilities. These people may have been different from the start, and that related with becoming a mathematician. Maybe they were interested in faces and more in numbers. Um, or uh, learning the formulas of mathematics competed yeah. with face representations. In the case of reading, we have evidence for the second, for competition. So we have the same children before and after they learn to read, and we can see that the face system is being pushed to the right hemisphere when the form area is being formed in the left hemisphere. That's actually amazingly fascinating. Mm. I know that work well, and mm. I, I really admire it. Last question, is you, or last observation. Um, uh, I, I really love the experiment with the signing, French signing. Uh -huh. And um, um, so you found a difference between the two groups and mm. you attributed the difference uh, between the signing. So the difference was you described as a, um, you were somewhat disappointed that there might have right. been uh, more impoverished, uh, an impoverished activation in the classic language areas for the signers than you saw, and you attributed the possible reason to be that the stimuli were um, perhaps artificially concatenated. Yeah. Um, uh, and I was just wondering if you had, um, just maybe didn't present it, had compared the French native signers to French people listening to French, because the task of having French people read and then comparing them to French people, French signing, looking at sign, um, in my own studies we found that it does activate different neural mm. roots. Reading mm. compared, reading compared to listening. Oh, I see. So well, if they were listening to French, the, a group listening to French and a group signing, you might have gotten a stronger mm. activation of the language roots. So, perhaps, okay. So, but remember, of course, there will be differences between listening to language and reading, yes. but that's not what we're showing here. What we're showing is the amount of correlation with constituent structure. So we've subtracted the components that are due to seeing the word or to hearing the word, and when we do that, we find that there is almost perfect overlap. So in other words, these areas that care about constituent structure, they are amodal. They don't care about visual versus auditory modality. Okay. Thank so you. in the in the deaf uh, subjects, we had the same brains processing visual language and sign language. I mean, written language and sign language. Oh, I uh, okay. In the okay. same so people. They were, they were the same people okay. reading or, oh. s or receiving sign language sentences. Okay. And um, we still found this strong difference in amount of activation. I th really think it's our stimuli. If I had known in retrospect, I would have used um, perfectly normal sentence and maybe playing the movie backward as the Newman study okay. did. And I th hope we would have the same amount of activation as for reading. But uh, okay, we, we didn't think of that at the time. It's a fascinating study. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I do. <laughs> um, your study on the, the last one on the sequence of beeps mm. with the last one that changed and you say that you suggest that maybe there's a structure there's a tree structure there too right where it's a you speculation. see it's a speculation right but 
I was thinking you have shown on the sentence structure that there's an increase of activation until the node closes and then there's a drop. Yeah. So maybe if you were to analyze it the same way, if your hypothesis of the tree structure is true, you should see an increase of activation and then a drop. Yeah. Would that be enough to support the tree structure? Um, I don't know that because it could still be concatenation, right? We're still looking for a selective marker of nesting. I think this is the one million dollar question, how nesting is coded by neural networks. Even people who do artificial neural networks, they don't know how to do that. You know? So there is a real challenge there. We, there are very good models for association. That's what neural networks do. Apparently, they are able to, uh, to acquire syntactic structures, but they don't do so in the same way as the human child does, I think. They do so through thousands and thousands of repetitions and eventually the network finds a sort of clue to uh, have syntactic structures. By the way, it's not working very well, still language translation and so on. So I think there is something quite novel to be found there for tree structures. But absolutely, I mean, we want now to use these geometrical and also sequential, very minuscule grammars, like three beeps and one boop, in the MEG, in the neural recordings, see what sort of structures they will activate, and specifically in the human brain. What's great is that these are not really languages. They are so simple. We call them languages, but they are accessible to monkeys. Certainly, it makes sense to present them to a monkey or to a preverbal child, and yet uh, we hope that we will find differences. Thank you. We don't have any more questions? Then, before we close. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I will be lifted. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will have to find a new luggage to return to France. So th th thank you. Um, I have to stick to the microphone, sorry. Uh, a thank you from everyone uh, in the PhD program in Education and Neuroscience and everyone here at Gallaudet. Thank you for coming. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. So, so everybody, please join us to the reception in SLCC. Thank you for...